Shalom, everyone. This is Amir Tsarfati. Again, I am super excited to be with you here watching, uh, excuse me, broadcasting from Galilee, from Israel, from our office here. And uh, there is a lot to talk about today. So we're going to start first with um, information that was just released today. Uh, in fact, over the last 48 hours that were during the April cyber attack of Iran on Israeli infrastructures, um, which, by the way, was a very daring and a very sophisticated cyber uh, attack, the Iranian hackers tried to elevate, to increase the level of chlorine in the Israeli tap waters, in the Israeli drinking waters. And uh, Israel, of course, has one of the best cyber securities in the world. In fact, we are teaching the world cyber security. We have uh, of the best companies in Israel, and we export it all over the world. But we managed to find high level um, um, warfare on behalf of the Iranians. I think I already reported that uh, as a retaliation to this Iranian attempt, Israel um, hacked into the uh, computers of uh, one of Iran's largest seaports. And uh, we created so much damage there that um, they are still trying to fix it up until today. Uh, but that is, of course, uh, on the cyber war. And just so you un to understand, the war is not only the things you see. It's not only guns. It's not only um, stones or rocks or, or setting things on fire. It's not only S-16s. It, it can be a cyber. In fact, we're moving towards more and more the cyber realm where uh, a lot of those things will take place in the future. Iran is very weak with its military equipment but apparently quite sophisticated when it comes to cyber attacks. Israel managed to prevent it, to thwart this whole thing, and we actually strike back in a much more effective way because we know how to do it. However, there's no doubt it's a different uh, ball game, and I just wanted you to, to know that one. In Lebanon, ladies and gentlemen, the people no longer fear Hezbollah. Yesterday, uh, there was a demonstration in Beirut right in front of the Ministry of Justice. And in, it was, for the first time, very clear calling to the government to disarm Hezbollah from its weapon and to, listen to this, kick any Iranian presence from Lebanon. Now, this is not Israel saying that. This is the Lebanese themselves who finally had the guts to go out of the streets and and you can see how much Hezbollah is weak now if the people aren't afraid to publicly, right in front of TV cameras, say that. They want to remove that state within state that, Le that Hezbollah created in southern Lebanon and in eastern Lebanon as well. Also, in Syria, just so you know, yes, well, last night, three different strikes of most likely Israeli F-35s on Iranian militia targets, three vehicles with anti-aircraft uh, batteries were destroyed. Um, a little bit more than that was destroyed, which I cannot talk about right now. But one thing I can tell you, Hezbollah is now running the show in the Imam Ali base on the Syrian-Iraqi border next to the city of uh, Al-Bukamal. And they sealed everything off, and now they're digging once again underground tunnels and bunkers to put stuff that had been destroyed by the Israeli strikes. Now, if that's not enough, um, there is a lot that is going on in the um, Syrian um, regime and the Syrian society. Look, Syria is a country. There's still uh, a president, there's still civilians, and there's still companies, there's still people living there, millions of people live there. And uh, in the last um, few weeks, there is a big drama going on there, almost like a soap opera, uh, between two families, the Assad family and also the, um, uh, the family of Makhlouf. And the Makhlouf family re is related to Assad by marriage of uh, Assad's father to uh, uh, the daughter of the Mahlou family. But my point is, is that for the longest time, the father of uh, Bashar al-Assad, uh, um, he's the one who 
um, managed to make the Mahlou family a very influential, very wealthy family. They are billionaires. They have millions of dollars stock in so many places around Europe and uh, other places. And they're funding Bashar al-Assad over the last few years. But it seems to me that something went wrong there. And apparently Bashar al-Assad needs cash. Uh, we don't know if it's because he needs the cash. Maybe it's because the Iranians need the cash or the Russians need the cash. But he is now demanding from the um, Mahlou family $200 million uh, for taxes that they never paid. Um, we're watching uh, how those families that are, uh, they own security companies and security services companies such as Alpha and Falcon. We're watching how they're basically uh, begging for Assad to forgive the, or to pardon that uh, debt. Uh, bec uh, but I, all I can tell you is that uh, right now, uh, the Syrian population is divided. Those that are siding with the president and those that are siding with the wealthy family. And that drama is all that is going on right now in the Syrian uh, streets uh, uh, nowadays. Russia uh, brought into Syria over the last uh, couple of days several brand new MiG-29 um, aircrafts. Um, and uh, we know that um, bringing them to Syria doesn't mean that they stay in Syria. Last week, they actually flew them from Khmeimim based in Syria all the way to Libya where they are helping General Haftar to fight against uh, the um, UN-sponsored government that is now it, it is also uh, somehow assisted by the Turkish Sultan Erdogan. So we're watching a lot of stuff going on with Libya and Syria and Russia and Turkey, even behind the scenes. Let me also share with you something quite interesting. You know that uh, as of now, and don't be surprised, but although Israel is uh, the sovereign in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount is not in, um, it's not in Israeli religious juris jurisdiction. In other words, rabbis don't control the Temple Mount. It's the Muslim Waqf. Now, the Muslim Waqf that is controlling the Temple Mount, the religious um, um, authority over there is consisted of mostly Jordanians and local Arab Palestinians. Um, believe it or not, but over the past couple of years and even more so in the last few months, Turkey has been uh, pushing more and more into East Jerusalem, into the affairs of the Temple Mount and the Waq, and Saudi Arabia decided enough is enough. We do not want any Turkish interference in the third holiest site for Sunni Islam, Islam in the world. And therefore, um, with American brokerage mediating and an Israeli silent approval, listen to this, the Saudis want to have three delegates in the Muslim waqf that is running the Temple Mount. Now, the, at first, the Jordanians didn't want to hear about that. You understand, Jordan and Saudi Arabia may be Arabs, may be Muslims, but Jordan is the product of the Saudi family's uh, um, violence against the Hashemites. So Jordan was born because the Hashemites were kicked by the Saudis from Arabia. And so the Jordanians are not happy to hear that the Saudis wants a stake in the control of the religious authority on the Temple Mount. However, uh, it seems like the Jordanians over the past few days lifted their um, opposition there and, and they're no longer saying no to it. I believe it has a lot to do with the fact that the Jordanians understand that they're barking up the wrong tree. Turkey won't help them. Turkey won't be their savior. Uh, Saudi can give them much more money and Saudi can be a much more of a benefit to them than that. And so we're watching all of that. And also remember, it is something that often being misunderstood by the Western world. The fact that Muslims are Muslim doesn't mean they're all united. You know that there are Sunnis and there are Shiites. But even within the Sunni world, the fact that they're all Sunnis doesn't mean they're all united. And under the surface, there's a lot of 
um, elements that are clashing. And one of them is the fact that the Turks are not Arabs. And the Saudis and the Jordanians are Arabs. Both of them are originally from Arabia. And so the Arabs feel that they are the patron of Sunni Islam and they are not going to give it to Turkey, which are, look, both the Persians, Iran, and the Turks, they are not Arabs. You understand that that's one of the reasons why the Arabs are so much against um, both Shia Islam or a Turkish uh, rebirth of a, a sultanate. Um, so it's very, very interesting to see the Arab-Turkish and the Arab-Persian conflict within the world of Islam. But I, I just wanted you uh, uh, to know that because that is also something that happened. Also, I want you to know that um, we talked about uh, what Hezbollah was doing, what Lebanon was doing. We, we talked about what's going on in Israel. Israel is moving forward. We believe that within a month, by July 1st, we are going to implement sovereignty and, and, and basically have an annexation of the Jordan Valley. Now, listen, everyone is warning us not to do it just like they warned us not to declare Jerusalem as, state, as a capital, just like they warned us not to declare statehood, they're always sowing fear and fear and fear and fear. Let me tell you something. My position has always been whatever you can, grab it now. It might not be there tomorrow. And I told that to the South African people when I did the Zoom meeting on Saturday. Every Saturday we do Zoom meeting with followers from different countries. Next, this coming Saturday will be from the UK. But I, they asked me, what is your position about the annexation? And I said, look guys, ever since 1917, we were promised something big and eventually we were given something smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And we always said yes. We said yes to the partition plan in 1947, even though Jerusalem was not in our hands. We said yes uh, and we declared statehood when uh, so much of what Israel today, it was not in our hands. We, we, we kept saying yes to almost every peace initiative because of one thing. Every time we say yes, we grab something. And when we say, and, and, and we know that the other side will say no. The only time the Palestinians said yes, and we agreed to that same thing was the Oslo Accord, which was the most horrible thing that could have ever happened to us over the past 30 years. So I can tell you folks, I can tell you that if the Palestinians are saying no, don't hesitate to say yes, because at least you grab something, whereas you didn't have it before. I don't think we're selling our lands. I don't think there will be ever a Palestinian state. I don't think you, we're ever giving green light to any Palestinian. I believe that if there is a chance with a friendly president in the White House to annex the Jordan Valley after 2000 years, do it. Palestinians will get used to it, just like they got used to the Jerusalem um, Embassy of America there. They will get used to all of that. Now, will they, you know, sound that they're happy? No, they're not happy. But they're not planning on two states also. You have to understand, I, I heard the radio today, and an Arab-Israeli parliament member said the following thing. We are seeking for a solution of two states a Palestinian state with no Jews, and another state that is not Jewish, but it's a state of mixed Arabs and Jews and of all its citizens. In other words, it's not an Arab and a Jewish state. No, it's an Arab without Jews, and it's an, a Jewish and Arab one. They do not want a Jewish state. They, they, we don't even talk about the same thing when we talk about two states for the two people. So you have to understand, folks, when they give you something, grab it. When you have a president that is okay with something like that, grab it before it's too late. And we have to do it as soon as possible before the November elections. Not that I, not that I think that the November elections are, are, are going to be a catastrophe for, for President Trump, but I'm saying you just don't know. Everything that is going on in America right now, it's quite um, alarming. And that brings me, ladies and gentlemen, to the main topic of this update, and that's the lawlessness, which is the enemy from within. Let me let me show you, uh, folks. Let me show you a quote from January 
23rd. This is just when the coronavirus was hitting China, was about to move further. And, and by the way, have you noticed that nobody talks about coronavirus anymore? Have you noticed that the media is not criticizing people for not keeping social distance? And have you noticed that all the masks that we're watching on TV right now in America have nothing to do with corona? They have to do with hiding their identity of those thugs. Now, let me show you what George Soros told CNBC um, on, May, on uh, January 23rd. Watch this. He said, Trump's problem is that the elections are still 10 months away and in a revolutionary situation that is a lifetime. I am saying again, in a revolutionary situation that is a lifetime. Uh, guys, I can tell you that we, whatever we're watching right now, whatever we are watching right now is carefully planned, well-funded by Soros and some of his best friends. Those piles of bricks are waiting for them in every major city where there are no building or construction sites. There are just piles of bricks everywhere. These people are being bused to those places. These people are being paid. They're being recruited. And it is just amazing that nobody's saying anything about that. Now, I want to tell you also that um, we're watching lawlessness. Uh, and, and, and this lawlessness that we're watching right now, it's not something new, as you know. It's, it's definitely not something new. I, I, wanna, I, I want to uh, remind you all that uh, we're talking about something that is the product of the politically correctness, that from being venomous is now being lethal, basically. Um, anyone, anyone that is, has no stake in society is, is actually, uh, he wants to destroy that society. You understand that anyone who is uh, at the very bottom of the social ladder because he is not interested in being part of this society, the politically correct mindset actually says that he must go to the top of the ladder by force. These are, uh, anyone that is in the ladder right now is privileged and you can take your place if you destroy and burn and sabotage and riot anywhere. It is justified and it's okay. I want to tell you, look, um, I just heard that um, some celebrities donated money. What for? To bail those Antifa people from uh, arrest in, in, Minas in Minneapolis, not to help businesses of black people, uh, who, who got destroyed by those thugs, but to bail those thugs uh, from from uh, their uh, arrest. So you can you can you understand, folks, that we're watching um, something that, by the way, is everywhere. This whole thing of words that create perception um, was born already in the Soviet Union, and I want to tell you that the Soviet Union used to pump lies to the people. And guess how they used to call their newspaper? Pravda. You know what Pravda is? Truth. We're going to tell you a lie. We're going to tell you that it's the truth. It will be called the truth. It will be presented as the truth. And before you know it, it will implode. But then it's going to be too late. What we're watching right now is the American uh, media. And it happens not only in America, it happens also in Europe right now. We are watching how lies are being promoted. They are being presented as truth. And then, of course, those people every time fall into the same trap and nothing is changing. Now, let me, let me make it very, very clear. I do not support what I saw on TV happen to George Floyd. Let me make it also very, very, very clear that um, I find it very strange and very odd that a policeman will just have his knee on somebody's neck and will be 
showing off this whole thing to the public for long minutes on camera. Um, I'm not sure what went on there. There's a lot of questions and red flags in this whole process. But one thing is for sure, all of us can agree that the death of George Floyd was unnecessary. This should have never happened that way. However, anything between that death and what we're watching right now is, is, is obviously not connected, nothing. The, we're watching a well-organized, well-orchestrated, well-planned and well-funded organization of people that are trying to create an atmosphere of revolution that will bring down the U.S. economy. And by the way, make it, I, I want to make it very clear to all of you. The U.S. economy after COVID-19 actually, believe it or not, wasn't doing that bad. Now, now let me explain what I'm saying. Um, I'm saying that um, the um, income, the average income in April went up 10.5%. Income went up. I actually know personally people who told me, it's a pastor, and, and he told me, Amir, some of my people in my church make more money now in coronavirus than they made when they were working. And it's true. The federal administration added $600 a week to the, um, to the unemployment. We know that um, yes, the consumption went down 13.6% because, and which means retreat of a $1.9 trillion, but that because everything was closed, nobody could buy anything. But I want to tell you that basically um, an indication of the fact the market did well and rebound was that the American stock market made it back to the 25,000 points of the Dow Jones. I mean, this and look what we are having right now. If coronavirus, that invented virus, didn't bring down America, let's plan. Let's move to Plan B. And Plan B, of course, is an invented fake revolution. And what makes me sad is I'm watching a lot of those videos, ladies and gentlemen. Most of those thugs are actually white people dressed in black that are minions of, of, of their rich bosses. And they are recruiting the local black youngsters to do things for money. And, uh, you know, you see all the celebrities pushing them to do stuff, even the social media uh, today, all of their um, icons went black. Everybody seems like uh, this is the right thing to do, go and riot and all that. And yet the vast majority of the protesters are not into this. I know they're not into this, but we're watching them being completely appalled with what they're watching, with what they're seeing. And, and I want to tell you something, just like, just like when in the civil war in, in, in Syria started, it started as a popular uprise against the atrocities of the government, then ISIS took over and all the terrorists took over and basically everything changed. Let me make it very clear. What we are watching right now is well-planned and well-orchestrated. And again, it's well-funded. And that's an important thing that I want you to know. Now, let me also tell you the, the little Middle East uh, angle of it. First of all, Iran, of all countries, Iran is criticizing America's treatment towards the black people. Iran that is butchering and killing thousands of its people on a yearly base. Iran that where you are hanging people from cranes, where you are uh, beheading people and they're... Iran is now uh, boasting. In fact, let me show you something that the Iranians published. Watch this, folks. This is America in flames. And General Soleimani, he's watching it, and he's almost like saying, this is because of what you did to me. I am now uh, behind this. Now, if that's not enough, the Arab propaganda and the Palestinian propaganda against Israel is using this 
take a look at this. Take a look at this. A an American policeman with his knee on 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 a black person, and an Israeli soldier with his knee on a Palestinian. You see what they're trying to say? They're trying to create this symmetric thing of the Israelis are 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 abusing the Palestinians and the American police is abusing the black people and they are creating the, by the way this is the narrative just make no mistake this is the narrative of um, black lives matter it's a very anti-semitic organization and um, I want to show you something that happened today I was watching on on um, and excuse me for this bad language but you have to see so a, a woman called Eve Barlow wrote this on Twitter, woke up to see that synagogues in LA have been graffited during the riots with the words free Palestine and F Israel, and that Dua Lipa is spreading anti-Semitic posts on her IG feed. How dare you bring the Jewish nation and community into the killing of black American lives? And look what Someone who claimed to be a Christian says, Black Lives Matter, Jewish whites were the most prolific slave owners in history. They, per they particularly created slavery in America. They created slavery in America, the Jews. And then look what they said. So with all respect and love, synagogues are as free game as any other building. Quite interesting, isn't it, to see that angle coming also in these riots. You would think these riots are about, about uh, somehow black, uh, uh, black people suffering from police brutality. That's what you would think. It, no, it has nothing to do with, with that. It has to do with, we want the Louis Vuitton bags from the shop in Manhattan, so we're gonna break the windows and take it. We want all the Apple products from Manhattan, we'll break into it and take it. We want all the televisions and we want all the accessories and we want all the shoes and all of it belong to us and we will take it basically. And that is what we are watching right now. We're watching the looters doing what they know the best and it's quite alarming, I want you to know. Now, I also want you to know that um, not only Iran, China is uh, extremely happy with what's going on. North Korea, Russian TV, RT, is broadcasting everywhere all the time in order to enhance the violence. And of course, in Venezuela, they are covering all of this with great enthusiasm and, and great gladness. And uh, basically, um, you are talking about... Um, you know, the axis of evil, happy to see what they call the downfall of America. And I want to tell you something, folks. When these countries are on your side, that means you belong to the axis of evil. That means that there is nothing good in what you are doing. Make no mistake, from day one, Antifa wanted Trump out. Make no mistake. This is maybe one of the main reasons they were, uh, you know, they, they started. We know that they, the, the deep state and the global uh, globalist cabal tried everything with this, with the President Trump. It started with the Russian collusion, and then of course it failed. Then it moved to the Ukrainian collusion, and the impeachment started, and it failed. And then of course you're talking about the coronavirus, and that also failed. And what's best? than to now accuse him for starting all of this when actually in reality it is the Democrats, it is the, the progressive, and look, the progressive Democrat uh, um, mayors and governors, it, most of these things happen under their guard. And, and they're not doing what they need to do to protect their place. That's why President Trump just appointed uh, a military uh, person to be the governor of D.C. So the National Guard is going now to the streets of D.C. and put a law and order in those places. Look, you have to understand, it all goes back to the academics. These are people that go to colleges and they go to universities 
and they um, and and this is something that started before even the rise of Nazism. It was called the Frankfurt School, the Frankfurt School of Thought. And by the way, all of of that school of thought um, was imported into America by many many um, teachers and professors um, and uh, into uh, universities in America. And you're talking about um, people that believe that um, um, they have their code and uh, no one else is allowed to say what he thinks. No one, there, there are, there's no pluralistic views in the academic world nowadays. The, the lie continues to grow. Um, that's why the academic world always understands those thugs, always understand terrorists and their noble uh, ambitions. They always understand Iran. They always understand third world. And it's, uh, it's amazing because one time Ahmadinejad, if you remember the, the president of Iran at the time who vowed to destroy Israel from the stage of the United Nations General Assembly, he was invited to an American university and he was accepted in the American university as royalty. And then of course, because he is the representative of those underprivileged Muslim um, that are suffering from America and uh, every word he said, all the, the, the staff of the university was just drinking. And then of course, one professor asked him, why are you so cruel to um, uh, the um, same, to, to people attracted to same sex, to the homosexuals in Iran? And you know what he answered? He said, there are no homosexuals in Iran. And everybody started rolling in laughter. And that's it. At this point, he was done with them. Because, you know, the... Um, the gender and the sex issue is even higher than anything that has to do with Muslim, Jewish, or whatever it is. Um, you also need to understand, folks, uh, that um, what we see also um, is an amazing thing that is going to create what we call the Ferguson um, effect. Now, what's the Ferguson effect? Let me let me tell you. Ferguson, you all remember that in 2014, Michael Brown was killed by a, a, an American white policeman in uh, Ferguson, Missouri, and uh, riots all across the United States. Barack Hussein Obama at the time was the president of the United States. And by the way, Barack Hussein Obama called them thugs. If you think that it's the, the language of President Trump, Barack Hussein Obama called them thugs when it was under his guard. And I want to tell you, that what happened after the 2014 riots that follow the killing of Michael Brown is the distrust of police by the people that basically led to an increased crime rate and homicide rate in major US cities. The more you attack your own law enforcement, the more you create a Ferguson effect where actually you will suffer. Look what happens. Wherever those governors don't allow people, don't, wherever they don't allow police to go in, guess what happens? All the violence is going on there. All the, the buildings are being burned down. All the shops are being looted. That's when there is no law and there is no order. The police is, uh, has less vigorous enforcement in situations that might lead to backlash as a result of such things. You have to understand those progressive mayors. Now, let, let, let me explain uh, uh, about, for example, um, and forget about the media, MSNBC and CNN, the New York Times and Washington Post, that they do whatever they can against, against Trump. But uh, let me, uh, let me uh, tell you that um, the um, um, progressive Democrat mayors um, in um, in uh, in those uh, cities, um, 
and I'll, I'll, I'll go all the way back to Chicago. If you remember, Ram Emanuel was the mayor that Barack Hussein Obama um, appointed to Chicago after he left Obama's office. And uh, we all know that um, their way to you know, fight you is, of course, to attack you verbally. And um, after something, after what happened in Chicago, uh, the increased violence, and also there, there was another killing. Uh, he he created a committee that will investigate the police. And guess who was standing in the head of that committee? Lori Lightfoot, of course. She is now the mayor of Chicago. And I'll tell you something. They made the police weak. And the police was in a dilemma. If the police will forcefully stop violence, they will be held as racist and vicious. And if the police will not do its job correctly, then they will be held as worthless and all the budgets will take will, will be taken from them anyway. So you're watching a point where both cases, uh, police is, is, is weak. And every time you're weakening your law enforcement, you're basically um, exposing your people. That's why President Reagan said, that the, 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 the job of the regime is not to take care of you, but it's to protect you. And, and, and you, you can take care of yourself. You, you can find your own job. You can you know, study your own thing. But to protect you, it's the job of the government. And apparently what we see is that if I was an American today, I would be buying guns and, and, and make sure that uh, I'm well armed because what is going on is that those mayors and governors, look, the daughter of uh, the mayor of New York City was arrested. And he, instead of condemning what she did, he's actually praising her. He said, I'm proud of her. At least she did something. This is the mayor of a city that last night was, you had riots and looting of Manhattan in the biggest uh, shopping area. This is this is a mayor. They're, they're, these are the governors. These are the that's the leaders that are weakening the police, that are backing the rioters, and they are happy to see all of this happening under their guard because they believe it helps their agenda to bring Trump down. I believe that, by the way, if I was an American and I was trying to think uh, what's going to happen now. I would vote for the strongest president I can ever find to put an end to all of this in November. Now, I want you to know that um, lawlessness is something that the Bible has been talking about for the longest time. And we, we can find lawlessness in the Old Testament. We can find lawlessness in the New Testament. And in these people, you have to understand, they beat up old ladies that are standing in front of their shops. They, they are not fighting for any good and noble cause. They are looking at everything the exact opposite than you do. And this is why the verses from Isaiah 5, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe uh, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe to men mighty at drinking wine, who woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. That is a sobering thing that Isaiah the prophet wrote 26, 2700 years ago. And uh, I, will, I will also tell you what Jesus said. Um, it, it, Jesus said, I will declare these people, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You who practice lawlessness cannot even bear the name of Jesus in, on their lips. He never knew them. If you are standing in front of an old lady and beating her up just because she's not allowing you to destroy her shop, there is no way Jesus can say, I know you. You're saved. You're great. Listen, you need to repent. You need salvation because obviously you don't have it yet. I want to show you also what Jesus said when it comes to the very end times in Matthew 24. Jesus answered and said to the disciples when they asked him about the end, 
He says, look, take heed that no one deceives you. Jesus already understood that in the end, a lot of deception is going on. And he says, look, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. He says, look, deception is not only, is not only about what's going to happen, but about who is the Messiah. And then I will, and then they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. Jesus said, look, these things are part of humanity. They're part of the downfall of this planet. Don't be troubled with that. Listen, it's not the end. Look, see that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass. But, at the, but the end is not yet. He said, now watch this, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes, various places. And these things are what? These are the beginning of sorrows, or in some places, birth pain. Beginning. And then he says, then I will deliver, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. This is already speaking to the people of Israel. And look what he's telling. They deliver, they, you will be hated by all nations. It's nation that will be hated by all nations. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Israel that will endure to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. It's amazing also that we see uh, another place in Thessalonians. Look what he says. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know that, it, that what res is restraining the Holy Spirit in the believers the church, that it may be revealed in his own time for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Look, the church will experience lawlessness because it is already at work. It has been at work when Paul was talking and writing to the Thessalonians, and it is. Look, lawlessness, guess when it started? At the Garden of Eden. When God had a law not to touch this, and they did touch this, that's lawlessness. And they called it a law, but guess who is the one who told them to do that? It was satanic law. It was a satanic decree. It was a satanic deception and satanic suggestion. And they followed that. So when you replace God with Satan, that which is law becomes lawless. And that which is a lawless thing is becoming your law. And then he says, and then the lawless one will be revealed. Look, the Antichrist is described as what the lawless one now what 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 lawless one we're talking about we're talking about he is against the laws of god he is not he's not for righteousness he's not for atonement for sin he's not for um uh, the plan of god and the will of god and the salvation of people no he's lawless the laws of God, the statutes of God, the heart of God, the mind of God is not in him. He is a lawless one. And when the lawless one will be revealed, that's why I think, by the way, when I'm looking at all of these thugs, I can tell you, I can see how the world will blind, blindly uh, follow the Antichrist. He is the chief lawless one. He's the lawless one. And watch this. And then the Bible says he will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. Only Satan is behind it. It's a satanic thing. It's satanic deception, satanic uh, blindness. What we are watching right now in the streets of the United States of America with Antifa and with all the cabal that is funding them, it's satanic. It's according to the works of the working of Satan. But the, the, the extra that the Antichrist will have will be with power, signs, and lying wonders. Right now, all they have is just a pile of bricks and torches. And, and, and it's not, but, but the Antichrist will amaze people with much more than that. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. They reject Jesus. 
they these people are so deprived in their mind these people hate instead of love they don't fight for anybody's rights they don't fight for anybody's cause they are just minions of a satanic plot to create havoc to create you know i mean tragedy basically but for this reason god will send them strong delusions that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness they they take pleasure in lawlessness in unrighteousness and i can tell you ladies and gentlemen the best way is to give them the gospel and to to continue to uh, pray and vote for a conservative regime in the country in america i can tell you one thing the democrats can't wait to take the reins again because then everybody every, i mean iran will be having fun no more sanctions venezuela will be having fun russia's sanction will be lifted as well we you know that uh north korea will no longer have the pressure to stop their thing we know that china everything will go back to china. i mean look all these countries are waiting around the corner for donald trump to fall and all they wait is for him to collapse and to fall and for the democrats to take over in what is perceived as a civil rights war right now it has nothing to do with civilian or rights it has to do with a satanic diabolic agenda and we're watching this and we're watching how it also has some anti-semitic colors to it and it also showing its its very anti-jewish face ugly face also ladies and gentlemen i'm going to tell you folks we live in the last days. These are the, this is the last hour. And I want to encourage all of you to stay strong on the word of God, on the promises of God. You know, the promises of God were given to us, not so we will not remember them and hold on to them. It's so we can remind ourselves. Look, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. You could have ended it with, you will have many tribulations. Oy vey, that's it. But he says, no, no, no. I want you to be of good cheer. He said, he said, for I have overcome this world. And if you are not a believer today, and if you are, by the way, I just found out, we have tens of thousands of viewers from Muslim countries and from many African Muslim countries all across you know, I want to tell you something, folks. Religion is not the answer. Neither Islam nor Judaism nor Catholicism, it's not the answer. You need a personal relationship with God. And the only way to do it is through Jesus who died for you. And he loved you all the way to the death. And he gave his himself for you. So you will not have to pay for your own sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that he whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. He will have eternal life. You don't have to die. You don't have to be condemned. You don't have to be dead while you're still alive. And then later on, you don't have to go through the second death. You don't have to stand before the great white throne of judgment. You don't have to go through the great tribulation. There is a way, and it is the only way out of all of this. And it's faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross and believing that he is the promised Messiah, inviting him to your heart after you acknowledge that you have a need for a Savior. And, and then move from the camp of the condemned to the not condemned. The Bible says that he who believes is not condemned and he who does not believe con is condemned already. We're all condemned. And the minute we believe, we're plucked out of that condemned camp and we are not condemned. You're going to watch things that are way worse than what we're watching right now. The world is not becoming better. 
Jesus is, has told us. But we need to be strong and ready. And the only way you can be ready for the return of Christ to take this church out of here is if you put your trust in him. So, Father, I pray that anyone who is watching this evening in this part of the world or morning around the world in other places, if he, and he's not ready, and he doesn't even know if he's saved, I pray, Father, that today is a day of salvation, that he should understand that he is in a need for a Savior, that he, we are all sinners, and the wages of sin is death. But the, our salvation has been purchased with the amazing blood of an unblemished, perfect lamb, 2,000 years ago. And then 50 days later, the Holy Spirit came in. It's still here. So the laws of God will not be written on a paper, but on the plates of your heart. We thank you, Father, that whoever is now listening and accepting, you will receive him as a son or a daughter. And they can, from now on, call you Abba Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Look, I don't know why I had that urge to lead that prayer, and I know that what we are going to watch in the future is even worse than that because the enemy is trying, and one thing fails, he's trying another, and that fails, he's trying another. Be of good cheer. For oh, Jesus overcame this world. God is always on the winning side. Never, ever will he lose the battle because the battle belongs to the Lord. Yivarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha, Yair Adonai p'na v'lecha v'yichunecha, Yisa Adonai p'na v'lecha v'yasem lecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord uh, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you, in the midst of these riots and confusion, he gives you peace. His peace that is that surpasses all understanding and it doesn't matter if you're a muslim if you're a jew if you're a catholic or orthodox or hindu or sikh or buddhist you need a savior and his name is yeshua our salvation and i pray that you understand it and that you will accept him tonight today because tomorrow might be too late amen so uh just to remind you folks uh to follow us on social media look i don't know how long i'm gonna be on facebook youtube twitter and all of that they really don't like what i'm saying and what i'm posting there is a newsletter that i uh, write myself every week so on beholdisrael.org on our website you can subscribe follow us on youtube facebook and instagram it's behold israel and um if you haven't done so get a hold of my books the last hour and the day approaching there you go uh, it will greatly bless you thank you god bless you and shalom from galilee from israel